The Dell Technologies Back to School event is on with deals on top tech for class, hobbies, and more. Plus, when you buy, you support a cause. With every eligible purchase, Dell will donate to UNICEF in support of GIGA, a UNICEF ITU global initiative to connect schools across the globe to the Internet. Accidental damage protection included. Get rare deals on select laptops and desktops powered by the latest Intel Core processors. Save now at dell.com slash deals. UNICEF does not endorse any company, brand, product, or service. Hey, shake and bake, Cal. Woo! Shake and bake! Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're talking about how to teach kids to be financially responsible with the host of the Art of Allowance podcast, John Lanza. Bonus doesn't necessarily involve increasing their allowance and you don't have to be a kid to pick up a lesson or two. Before that, we'll share a headline about paying. Does it matter what payment method you use at the store? Turns out it does. We'll help you choose the right way to pay. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky stacker looking for help. And then I'll share some hilariously comical trivia. And now, two guys who are emotionally kids at heart. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Nothing I like being better than the uh, youngest guy my age. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the uh, math equation that doesn't work for the win podcast. Uh, OG giving me the look there as he's trying to figure that out. I I like uh, having a young attitude, man. Don't you? Do you like being young at heart? I can't hear anything because I'm chewing so yeah, fast trying to... Uh, he's like a 12-year-old. All I hear is myself chewing. in his mouth full of cookies. He's got a mouth full of cookies. It's biscuits. <laughs> it's biscuits. He's got a mouth full of biscuits. Is that Peppa Pig? That's any uh, British person. Yeah, I just made it up. Oh. It, I was going to say, yeah. it does sound like a little Peppa Pig line. It's, youngest guy in the room. That's that's me. I meant youngest guy. Well, okay. Well, yes. okay. But we're talking Flex. about in all things other than the calendar. Because you are absolutely the oldest guy in the room. By far. Easily. Off of the calendar. Easily. What time do you go to bed, OG? What time yeah. do you go to bed? 9.45. How many people do you let on your lawn? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> do you read the paper? Every uh, weekend morning? Oh, no, because it's usually <laughs> night, noon by the time I get up. How many kids on skateboards have you yelled at this week? <laughs> 17. I, your Honor, the defense rest. Yes, the defense, you can't even the defense rest. <laughs> We've got a fantastic show today. Uh, given that juvenile moment, we're going to have a, a few more. John Lanza, who's the chief mammal. That is his, that is his uh, moniker at his company, He has a fantastic brand that helps credit unions teach uh, kids about money and obviously a fantastic podcast. And by the way, Doug, you said that um, don't have to be a kid to get lessons. You know what? If you're just somebody starting out, whether you have kids, are a kid, doesn't matter. John Lanza always brings some great tips for well, better communication in yeah, your family. Yeah, I mean, the basics that you would teach a kid are exactly the basics that you need as an adult. There's a dude named Robert Fulham who made a boatload of cash on that principle. I don't know who that is, but sounds yeah, you great. Do. Everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Remember all oh, those books? Yes. There were like five of those oh. books. That dude is sitting on his own private island right now because of those books. Independently wealthy yeah. on the backs of all the people trying to learn stuff from kindergarten. When you could have just picked it up in kindergarten and you would have been fine. I mean, some of us were sleeping. Sounds like he ripped us all off. But actually, you know what's not a rip off? This right here. Well, lots of people out there in the used car and new car market right now with back to school going on and the increasing demands of going lots of different places. And as you know, getting a car is exciting and you deserve a hassle-free buying experience. You can get a decision in seconds and enjoy great rates because with everything you need in one place, Navy Federal's Car Buying Center is your one-stop shop for researching, financing, buying, protecting, and enjoying your next car. You could search for new and used cars, access vehicle history reports, super, super important that you do that, enjoy discounts on auto insurance, and more. 
and you can make the most of your time on the road wherever you go with our flagship credit card. We spoke recently on the show about the protections that using credit or hitting the credit button when you use your debit card, what that provides. Well, if you pay your bill off every month, stackers, getting rewards is something you should be looking for too. Not if you don't pay your bill off every month, then you need to start that habit. But if you do, you want to take advantage of this. Whether you're taking a trip to relax or see somewhere new, you deserve a travel card that does the work for you. Flagship credit card will earn you three times points on travel, plus up to $100 in statement credits toward TSA PreCheck or Global Entry and a free year of Amazon Prime. With two times the points on all purchases outside of travel, the rewards don't have to end when your vacation does. For more on Navy Federal's car buying experience and flagship rewards, visit NavyFederal.org. Open to the Armed Forces, the DOD veterans and their families. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA. Amazon Prime is a registered trademark of Amazon.com, Inc. or its affiliates. Visa is a registered service mark of Visa used by Navy Federal under license. Probably not the way our sponsor wanted us to begin that spot. Why not? We said it wasn't a ripoff. It's not a ripoff. That's a strong endorsement. It's fantastic. You know what? I'm going to back it up with another one right here. Are you currently enjoying the show on the Stitcher app? Then you need to know Stitcher is going away on August 29th. Yep, going away, as in kaput, gone, dead. Rest in peace, Stitcher, and thanks for 15 years of service to the podcast community. So switch to another podcast app and follow this show there. Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Yes. One, two punch, Doug. We're on it. We got OG here. We got Doug here. We've got John Lanza up talking to mom. He is going to give us some tips for beginners. But before that, a headline. So let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is written by Amani Moise. Amani. What was that last name? Moise. Not moist. Okay. M O I S. That would be a rough way to go through life. <laughs> I, I, I'm moist. <laughs> Maybe not. Amani writes Buyers have more ways to pay for things than ever before Apple Pay, Venmo, credit cards, and dozens of other options. I was Venmoing somebody uh, about half an hour ago. Oh, gee. Uh, I did not get it. Try again. <laughs> yeah. As much as the purchase itself. Each of the different payment methods provides various conveniences, perks, and protections from fraud. Credit cards have long been the default option of choice, but higher interest rates have now raised the cost of carrying a credit card balance. This is something, OG, that we haven't covered in a long time, that actually uh, deciding how you pay actually actually does matter. Like setting up a cash strategy can be a, uh, well, maybe it, it might not help you win, but it certainly may stop you from losing. Well, and this is something that's just relatively new, you know, over the last, what, maybe five or seven years before that, it was just kind of either charged it or you paid cash or, or some of us wrote checks. Whoa. Hey, easy there. <laughs> like where's the checkbook, honey? I need to pay the lawn guy. <laughs> I actually had a situation where I had to write a check. I had to write a check maybe three months ago and it, it did take me 20 minutes to figure out where the checkbook was. I had no idea. You know, I just paid my summer taxes and I had to write a paper check because any other method I had to pay like 3% convenience fees. It's like Ticketmaster is oh. running my local city taxes. If I want yeah. to pay online or even do a direct pull right out of the checking account, I had to pay extra. Well, that 3% is a big number on your property taxes. You know, so, that with restaurants too, by the way, when you use a credit card at a restaurant more oh, often, sure. they're, they're tacking on the 3% fee. We just actually had a stacker talk about that in the basement. It might have even just been a couple of days ago. Oh, did they? She's yeah. a small business owner. I think she's in Texarkana. She owns a liquor store in Texarkana. She's got to be your best friend, dude. <laughs> she <laughs> Not, said she's really wrestling with this because, like, I don't know, she talked about something like five or eight years ago, the majority of her business was cash. And now that's flip-flopped, and she oh. she's wrestling with, do I raise my prices or do I... Tack it up. But not to change the subject, Doug, but I forgot. You just paid your taxes. Your uh, basement dues are due as well. Your your summer basement dues. We have BOA We charge dues. a 3% fee even for cash. We do. So <laughs> you gotta, if you want to be on the Friday episode, you have to, you have to get, get, get paid. The membership that. fee. 
Well, and to your point, OG, listen to how much money transfers are changing. Apps like Venmo and Zelle, uh, they write here, processed nearly $900 billion last year. Consumer Finance Protection Bureau expects that number is going to be $1.6 trillion by 2027. We're clearly changing the way that we pay, and I think maybe we need to think, uh, do we need to be a little bit more careful? Because payment apps, according to this piece, are among the fastest growing sources of fraud reports and losses, according to the FTC. Overall, fraud losses have increased more than fivefold to $1.2 trillion since 2019. Losses tied to payment apps jumped from $5 million to $47 million. So, wow, $5 million to $47, $47 million of fraud on $900 billion of transactions. Still, um, yeah, you know, that's, that's really not a huge number. But the problem with PayPal, Zelle, Venmo, Cash App, there's some others. I'm missing them. The problem with those is that it's kind of fire and forget. You have sent the money, and if you type the wrong cell phone number in there, you're hoping on the goodwill of the other person to go, oh, yeah, that's not me. Yeah, I think you meant to send this I to I got to give else. that money back. Yeah. Right. It's, it's kind of sort of like a wire transfer. Remember remember years ago, there was a, a rash, and I'm sure it's still going on, but a rash of title fraud. You know, we where had, like, you we had, would, remember we had Shannon Allen on the show, the blogger who, uh, $55,000. Yeah. She wired to a fraudster who was pretending to be her title company. Yeah. And that's kind of instant ish payment also, and kind of sort of buy and forget it's gone. You know, you can't get it. We have been longtime American Express users. And I will, Doug, to your point about the 3% fee, I'll pay the 3% fee. For me, that's the, that's the insurance that this transaction is going to go through the way that I want it to go through. And I'm going to get the service that I want. Now, obviously, taxes are right. a whole different scenario. But you, know, you had an example a couple of days ago where you were talking about the knife that you bought and how that kind of went belly up. And thank goodness you, you made knives. Yeah, knives. Knives. <laughs> knives. Good thing you paid with your credit card and not yeah. Venmo, right? Because you've been out. Uh, we've had tons of stories personally where, you know, the product just wasn't delivered as advertised and, um, you know, it's just easier to fight Amex as opposed to somebody else. Let's walk through these different types of payments because they, they go through them all. And I think it's a good thing for us stackers, credit and debit cards. It starts off with when you swipe or tap your card to, or authorize a card transaction online, the merchant's bank communicates with your bank through a card network like MasterCard or Visa or American Express to ask permission to withdraw a certain amount. Your bank then decides whether to approve the transaction based on your available funds or credit and the likelihood the transaction is fraudulent. So you got these banks, OG, looking out for you when it comes to credit cards, debit cards too. But remember, debit card only if you process it through the Visa or MasterCard system. If you put your PIN number in there, now it's going directly out of your bank account and you could end up uh, not having some of the same protections. Yeah, that's a different way. It says a credit card, though, can be expensive if you don't pay the balance in full. Higher interest rates now raise the cost of carrying a credit card balance. Paying off a $1,000 balance in 12 months at the current average annual percentage rate of 22.16 means $103 in interest compared with 77 roughly. It's going to cost you uh, about, uh, what, almost 25 bucks more, 26 bucks more. Debit cards don't offer the same re rewards as credit cards since their issuers make less money. They do come with similar fraud and payment protection, again, if you use them that way. Uh, let's look at digital wallets like PayPal or Apple Pay. Among the safest and easiest ways to pay online, checking out with a wallet typically faster than paying with a credit card directly since you don't have to re-enter billing information and shipping address. All the protections and benefits associated with the underlying card are still in effect for wallet transactions so it's best to connect these wallets to a credit card directly to maximize your protection. I like that advice. Uh, I've been using wallets more and more. Have you been using them, guys? Yeah, absolutely. Super easy. And I've even started using the like Shopify one, and I think it's Shopify, where if it's offered, it already knows all the stuff. It texts me a code, yeah. you know, and, and then I type the code in, and it fills in all the shipping and the credit card information and all that sort of stuff. It's a lot simpler. Which I think that's why people think that because that's so easy and wallets are so easy that peer-to-peer -peer payment apps like Venmo, Cash App, and Zelle are the same thing. Right. And they're not. They are not. It's a great way to send money to friends and family, but they're now used in more settings. They move money more quickly instead of waiting on banks to approve the transaction. It's authorized once the sender hits submit. It's almost impossible to get money back once it's been sent. Of course, yep. that's the same for bank transfers. 
and uh, that can be ugly. I like uh, what this gentleman at uh, a company called BioCatch talks about who works in this area. The slower it is, oh, gee, he says, the slower it is, the greater likelihood you'll be able to get recourse. <laughs> so just because you can do it fast through Venmo, if you're not sure of the transaction, Venmoing somebody money, buyer beware. Well, and that's really the crux of it. If it's a small dollar amount, it's a quick transaction. You're for certain you know who the person is. It's not, you know, a life altering sum. It's not a big transaction. Use Venmo, use PayPal, Zelle, that sort of stuff. You're selling a car and the guy says, well, I'll just Venmo you the cash or I'll, you know, it's like the bigger the transaction, the more opportunity there is for, you know, something to go wrong. And you want to have some of the, some of that protection in there to afford yourself the opportunity to have some recourse if something does go wrong. Coming up next, John Lanza, he's on a mission to help parents raise money, smart kids and help families live happier, more fulfilled lives. He's the author of The Art of Allowance, a short practical guide to raising money, smart, money-empowered kids, host of The Art of Allowance podcast, creator of The Art of Allowance Project, which features The Money Mammals, which is a DVD series. He actually got his start in uh, television and in animation. And uh, so The Money Mammals are a super fun series of books and DVDs for kids to learn about money. But today we've got John on the show and he's going to help us get back to school. You know, OG, with your kids going back to school, also a good time for parents kind of to go, okay, our kids have a curriculum at school, but personal finance not in there. How do we add that to our curriculum for our kids? So John's going to help us with that. John's up next, uh, but Doug, to get there ahead of time, you've got some uh, trivia that actually... Might be a little bit about um, some of the stuff John's interested in. Animation? Uh, Okay, we'll see where it goes. I'm not sure yet. (laughs) Sometimes I just start talking and we see what comes out. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today is telling joke day and I've got a great knock-knock joke for you, but um, but you got to start it. So, okay. um, Okay, go. Go. Knock-knock. No, no, not... Dude, not not you. You. (laughs) God. Said you. The listener. We're oh trying to God. break the fourth wall. We're letting the listener take part in the show. Right. And your ego just assumes that when I say you, we're talking about <laughs> OG. That math adds up. Okay, we're going to try this again, everybody. Okay, shout at your devices. You go first. Okay, uh, who's there? Okay, well, I guess we're probably never going to know the ending to that one. But not only is it Tell a Joke Day, but on this day in 1930, the first ever color cartoon with synchronized sound debuted. It was created by cartoonist Ub Iwerks, who, after leaving Disney, started his own company, Iwerks Studio. Ub Iwerks, a guy whose name sounds like the answer to the trivia question, which of these is definitely not a name, created a series called Flip the Frog, starring a character who was... A frog named Flip. Huh. There's a fun coincidence. The (laughs) the debut episode of Flip the Frog, remember, it's a frog named Flip. It was was titled Fiddlesticks, and for the first time in animation history, audiences were treated to an animated cartoon with sound and color. So this got me thinking, what was the longest-running cartoon in history? Although most people who've taken the poll that I ran in my imagination this morning believe that The Simpsons is the longest running cartoon, it's actually Looney Tunes, which ended its most recent series in 2020. The legendary Mel Blanc voiced the beloved and mischievous Bugs Bunny along with other characters. So here's my trivia question. Which other characters did Mel voice in the original series? I'll be back with the answer after I see what wacky Marmaduke is up to now. Stackers, I'm avid comic strip reader and three-time coloring contest winner, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. That Marmaduke, he's always doing something crazy. Today, he caught the dog catcher, <laughs> which makes him a dog dog catcher. He's a, like a dog catcher, dog catcher. Unbelievable. Today's trivia question was, in addition to Bugs Bunny, what other characters did the legendary Mel Blanc voice in the original Looney Tunes series? Blank was hired to voice not only Bugs Bunny, but nearly every other Looney Tunes character as well, including Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, Elmer the Fudd, Elmer the Fudd, right? Tweety Bird, Sylvester the Cat, and so many more. So the answer's probably 
look, whatever you guessed, you were right. At the height of his career, this is the good part, voice acting earned blank $20,000 per week. A salary I could easily get used to. And now you'll hear the voice of another man who's making stuff for kids who will grow up to appreciate him even more when they're adults, John Lanza. And I'm so happy he's here with us in mom's basement, John Lanza. How are you, man? I'm great, Joe. I'm uh, super excited to uh, finally make the cut and get on Stacking Benjamins. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I'm happy that you said yes, that you would come on. And when we met at the Relevant Conference, finally, when I saw you, I'm like, I felt like it was my long lost brother who I've never met in real life. Yeah, I felt the same way. It's like watching you facilitate at a conference just got me excited. I'm like, I, ha oh, I just have to talk to Joe. So I'm glad it's worked out and we're Stop. here. Stop. Keep going. Stop. Keep going. <laughs> you Stop. like that? Here go. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's asking this question. Money Mammals, just the coolest name. The chief money mammal is like the best business card. Where did the idea first come from? Oh, complete ripoff. So way back in the day, we were in a different life, basically doing some work with Build-A-Bear. And Maxine Clark is the owner of Build-A-Bear. I got her card and it said on it, Chief Executive Bear. And at the time, I was kind of like a little bit you know, jaded, 20, late, late 20s, early 30-year-old, didn't have kids yet. It was like, that is the corniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but I never forgot it. And <laughs> as soon as I had my own company, I'm like, I can't call myself a CEO because I don't, like, I'm making this up as I go along. And I just, I thought that Chief Executive Bear was such a great idea. And I just went with Chief Mammal because however corny I thought it was, it stuck with me and it put a smile on my face. And that's the idea behind Chief Mammal. So hats off to Maxine Clark. But I like that. It's not really a ripoff. I mean, I don't know if you've read Steal Like an Artist, Austin Kleon's book, but. Oh yeah, all three of them. You riffed on it, you made it your own and you yeah. paid homage. You, you say, hey, this is exactly where we got it from, which is, I think, the way art is built. What about getting interested in kids and money, though, John? I mean, wh where does your interest in teaching kids about better money habits come from? Yeah, well, this is just scratching the itch. So it's like when my wife and I had our kids who are now going to college, which is crazy, we just knew that we wanted to raise them money smart. So that, that was the kind of starting point. And my wife seems to have come out of the womb money smart. I'm more like you. I've taken a very meandering path <laughs> on, the, on, on the way to money smarts. John, you're getting your money's worth from the journey, you know, like I feel <laughs> exactly. like the good golfers on a golf course, like they don't get their money's worth only hitting, you know, three or four shots. I take 20 shots. I mean, if you're going to go out and golf, you might as well see the sights, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I'm a charter member of the Fairway Preservation Society, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to practice for the masters, you have to make sure you can get out of the rough. Exactly. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So I saw this kind of meandering path. I came from my background. I worked in animation for a long time. So I saw how powerful media can be and, and really well-designed characters and interesting characters and interesting storylines. And I thought, well, why don't we take something that's fairly boring on its face? Uh, you know, kind of financial literacy. No kid's going to want to listen to any lecture on that. And just make it fun. And so... We came up with this mantra, we'll share and save and spend smart too. Uh, in fact, my brother wrote the songs. This was like some advice from a mentor, my original boss. He said, if you're going to develop any kind of program, he said, be prepared to love it for a decade. And so I knew if I, if I was going to make this work, I wanted to have someone write songs that I knew that I would love down the road, right? So not kind of like kitschy kid songs, but fun songs. And so that was the idea. So we have this idea, you know, the mantra is we'll share and save and spend smart too. And we realized that this was something, it's something that I think a lot of parents might be interested in is trying to raise money, smart kids and do it in kind of a fun way. And that was really the genesis of Joe the Monkey and Clara J. Camel and Marmoset and Pigs the Bank and the whole Money Mammals crew. I like the idea, though, of creating something that you'd love forever, because I think about like Pharrell singing that song, Happy, that's an earworm. But if I had to sing that song on stage, like every night on a, like an 80 city tour, I would yeah. want to just bash my head in. Well, that's why it's such a good point. And it's why people like Bob Dylan and David Bowie, like even though people get frustrated with the fact they wouldn't play the songs that they want to hear, if I were them, it's totally what you would want to do, which is just play new stuff. I mean, you know, play some of the old stuff, but you've got to reinvent yourself. It seems fairly easy. You could certainly go down that path. So it's it's nice to try to carve your own path. 
Let's set the stage here. You know, as we are getting back to school, this is our back to school episode. So while the kids are getting the curriculum at school from their teachers, our child's ultimate teacher and hopefully a good money teacher, what is the thing we should be most focused on? Like, let's talk broadly, strategically. What kind of a environment do we want to create? What type of a mood do we want to set as we're teaching people about money? What's kind of the overarching framework, John? Yeah. I would say open conversation is probably the kind of that's the overriding point. So you want to start early with your kids. And the reason you want to start early is that, one, they're very receptive to it. Uh, They're very receptive to you as a parent the earlier you start versus, as we know, is once you get kind of tweens and teens, they become a little less receptive to your messages. But by starting early, you can start to build good habits with them and I really think this conversation part is such a key thing. So being prepared from a young age, from their young age, to be open to a conversation, even as young as like two years old, right? So you're not talking to them about anything complex, like the rule of 72, or not that that's that complex, or compound interest. You're just being prepared for the conversations about money at a young age, because you don't want to shy away from those conversations. And so that also gets at having you as a parent just getting comfortable with the fact that the mistakes that you've made are actually not bugs in this system. They are features that you can use to help teach your kids. You can realize, one, your kids are mainly going to learn from their own experiences. But two, you can share the experiences that you've, you've had that have not been so positive as a way of saying, you know, one, I'm not, you don't have to hold me up on high with regard to this. And two, I understand that you're going to make mistakes as we go through this process. Does that make sense? Well, I love teaching your kids from an early age that mistakes are a part of the process and that I make them too. I mean, that open, honest relationship, I think is great versus being the parent who, you know, tries to come across as squeaky clean. Your kid finds out later on the mistakes. I mean, you know, as they grow, they're going to learn where you mess stuff up. So better for you to teach them to be open about that. I do want to ask about this though, because you bring up a point about these open conversations. So How much do I involve my kids then in the quote adult stuff, right? Do I involve them in, so like I advocate this uh, family budget meeting every week. Do we involve them in that 20 minute conversation that Cheryl and I have? Do we involve them in, you know, utility bill is due? Like how far do we go in this open conversation? Those are great questions. I was actually thinking more on the younger side. When you do get older, I think you do need to, I mean, I'll give you one example. So I think it's a great idea to do some kind of periodic budget meeting. We didn't necessarily do that. But one of the things that we did was on lead up to the discussion about college from, I think once they were tweens, so somewhere in that kind of 10 to 12 range, we showed them how much they had in their 529s, right? So they have a sense of, you know, there is money being saved for college and college is going to cost money, and there is some money there for you, right? That type of thing. So being open and honest about that, there's a a camp of kind of radical transparency. I think it's very much a personal decision. I lean towards what Ron Lieber says about this in his book, uh, The Opposite of Spoiled. It's like once those kids get to become teens and they have a sense of, you know, being at other kids' houses, they have a really good sense of how much money you're making, how much money, you know, other people are making, And so you don't have to necessarily sit down and say, you know, here are our exact finances. But to your point, it's not a bad idea to certainly talk to them about here are utility bills. For example, a great example is if the utility bills go through the roof, you know, enlisting the family to help bring the utility bill down. That kind of practical discussion, I think, is is worthwhile. So it's engaging with the money conversation And it's going to be different for different families, but engaging with it really matters. But I'm not advocating for, you know, full transparency of, you know, here is every single dollar that we have allocated in our family for for whatever use it might be. Well, I think it's tough if you're struggling with money. Like, I don't know, I want my kids to be educated, but I also don't want to worry them that we might be out on the street next week. Yeah. And that comes to age appropriateness, right? So obviously, if you're going through real difficult times, you're not going to sit down and have a, you know, a heart to heart conversation with your five year old. But, you know, your 10 or 11 or 12 year old knows if there's been a major change and it's worth engaging with them, not to say, you know, one, to give them some confidence that you are going to figure out how to kind of get past whatever this financial blip might be. But two, just to to recognize that you're going through some difficulties. You know, so it's giving them the confidence that you're going to get 
past the difficulties, but recognizing it because they know. I mean, they can feel it. Sure. They can feel your stress. So being open to engaging with that and engaging with them is just essential. It's funny. I was just listening to Simon Sinek talk about exactly what you said. It's not just kids. It's just everybody. When you show up and something isn't completely authentic, like people just know, like they just completely know. So just show up to help your kid and give them everything you can. And I think, uh, yeah, the more you hide, the more it's going to be. You can read me like an open book. If I'm bored in a conversation, <laughs> like last night, I was at my mom's house, love my mom, but she's talking about a roof for you know 20 minutes, the new roof that's going on. And my wife afterwards, she's like, you didn't say a thing. I was like, I was tired of talking about roofs. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hide. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same thing. Maybe that's why we get along so well. When an assistant I had when I was a financial planner, one uh, a person came up to her, came up to Susan and said, I just don't know what's on Joe's mind. And she goes, are you kidding me? Ask him because <laughs> he will tell you way more than you want to know, like way more, <laughs> like just please. And when you ask him, you're going to regret doing it. So yeah, yeah, I love that. You know, when you're talking about 529 plans, and about whether you share, you know, how much money you've got for retirement, that sort of thing, the, the details with older kids. Your kids haven't had PR training. I mean, unless you kind of taught them, but how do you make sure some of that stuff stays in the house instead of all of a sudden your neighbors telling you about how their, your kid told their kid about what your credit card debt number is? There's not much we can do. The only thing we can do on that, I think, is modeling, because I really actually don't know. It's a, it's actually it's a really good question, and it's something I think about a lot is, you know, what are these kids talking about? And with regard to the 529, I know they have a sense from their friends. So they've had these discussions. I'm fairly sure with our kids, you know, they're not walking around crowing about their 529 plan amounts, but I don't know totally. And I think with some of their closer friends, they probably have had kind of more intimate discussions about that. But it's a good question. And I think the only thing you can do, well, not the only thing, one thing you can do is model some modesty and some decorum so that they have a sense of, okay, well, this, this is not something you don't go out and crow about money in general. Because like, you know, if you start crowing about it, there's always a bigger crow. And so <laughs> it's like, so just, uh, just the decorum. So that, that's about all I can offer there is just the modeling side of things. <laughs> all right, let's get to the uh, elephant in the room. Every person talking to you, I'm sure John wants to talk about this next topic and a way of getting at this on your podcast, the art of allowance, you actually have a mini episode dealing with allowances. So let's listen to you. And this is a clip from the art of allowance podcast. I often see folks questioning the value of an allowance, and I'd like to respond with my perspective. When I wrote my book, The Art of Allowance, a short, practical guide to raising money-smart, money-empowered kids, I thought about trying to coin a clever new phrase to replace allowance because I know some folks bristle at this idea of allowing their kids to have money. Still, Allowance is a term that most folks immediately associate with raising money-smart kids. So I decided to focus instead on what I call the art of employing an effective and purposeful allowance. I love this idea of the art of the allowance because obviously there's some, some people have, have maybe used some science behind it, but like you, I've noticed on the Art of Allowance podcast, John, you've had different guests on that have some different ideas. So let's talk through this. Let's talk about it. We can, and I'll link to, by the way, this episode of your podcast on the show notes so people can dive into that full discussion. But let's have, let's have a little bit of that here. So framework around an allowance. How should this work? So the key for the allowance is kind of identifying your why for an allowance. And that is that you are here to help your kids learn to become money smart. You're giving them allowance to get experience with money because we all know that is that experiential learning is the primary way we learn the hard lessons of life. There's two other ways that that could happen. That can happen through modeling, good and bad, and it can also happen through lecturing. And we all know how powerful lecturing can be, uh, particularly with our, <laughs> with our kids. So the experience is the point of that allowance. It also serves as a catalyst for this conversation that's been kind of the thread of our entire conversation. And so that's the why 
behind an allowance. And you really want to start it early. You want to start at age five, and then you want to introduce to them this idea of making money smart choices, because the reality is every time you're getting some money, you are making choices, whether they're conscious or unconscious. And so at allowance time, we'll have three jars, the share, which is for charitable giving, save for longer term items, and then the spend smart. We add the smart so that we're kind of emphasizing this idea of thinking about our spending. And then you just allocate that money into a basic allowance for a five-year-old would be $5. And the way we did it, again, it's the art. It's going to be different for each family is we would put uh, $1 into share, $1 into save, and $3 into that spend smart. And the idea is the sharing is telling them where you value charitable giving. The saving is we value the idea of paying yourself first. And then the last one is this is money that you can go and uh, – <laughs> Do whatever you want with. It seems to me on that, do whatever you want with a lot of parents. I know my parents uh, a long, long time ago didn't want me to make mistakes, but I think there's got to be some bravery there, John, where you've got to see a mistake coming as a parent. You know, it's a mistake for your kid to spend money on this. And I think you kind of got to let them do it anyway and have the bravery to circle back later and go a little Dr. Phil on them. <laughs> like, how'd, <laughs> so how'd that work out for you? I think brave is a great word because I think that is a leap that we have to take with those kids. And again, it's going to be different for different parents because certain parents are going to be more brave than others. And if you're a little less brave, you might ramp up your advisory <laughs> and other parents are more brave and they, they'll be like, okay, I'm just going to let them learn. The other thing is understand it from the kid's perspective. So I remember uh, one of them buying some play set. It was like, we call it my colorful unicorn. So we're not uh, calling out any actual products. But she bought this you know, $20 play set. And when she bought it, I'm thinking this is going to be, she's going to be done with this in a week or two, right? And she was. But she also got a lot of play out of it. So as much as I look at it and feel like that seemed like kind of junk, argument can be made in my favor. She got a lot of pleasure out of spending that money on that thing. So her perspective is a little bit different than my perspective. And that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some things that they buy and they realize, oh, that I really shouldn't have bought that. And what it, this does is by giving them control and letting them uh, spend the money is that you now have a reference point for a conversation. So if, if you see that this becomes a pattern and then you say, you know, you go to the store and they're getting their third item and they're not playing with those other two items, you can say, well, how much time have you spent with you know, these other two things, it seems like you bought them and, you know, nothing's happening. You know, you're not playing with them anymore. Now, they may not say, oh, wow, you know, have an epiphany and say, I don't want this thing. But what you can do at that point is if, as a parent, if you're kind of at your wits end, you can say, you know what, I'm going to call a timeout here. We're going to wait a week or we're going to wait a few days, what we call the waiting period. And then we'll come back if you still want it. You can then come back and get that item. It's a way of putting guardrails. And that's that's why I call it the art of allowance, because you just have to kind of work within how every kid's going to be different and every scenario is going to be different. Every family is going to be different. Every kid within each family is going to be different. So it's providing some kind of structure and a framework within which the parent can work with the kids. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I like teaching those guardrails too, because those are guardrails that are great to use when you're an adult, right? You really crave something, <laughs> you know, that it's something that you think that you're going to want, but you also don't want to regret it. So what do you do? You put it in the Amazon shopping cart and you wait a week and you set that timer. And if you still want it a week from now, then it probably was good. Man, I did that when Sirius Satellite Radio first came out, XM Sirius. I did that for a year and a half. I just sat and sat because I thought, am I really going to need a, a radio subscription? Like, how bad will that be? And when a year and a half later, John, I still wanted it. <laughs> I was like, okay, I think I'll get it. Now I've been a subscriber forever and I use the heck out of it because I just like, believe it or not, I like radio. Joe, I did the same thing with my, I have this bag, right? It was a $200 bag, but I knew exactly what, what I wanted. I wanted a standing bag. And when I travel, I want it to be kind of like my office, Right. And I waited six months because it seemed like an outrageous price to pay for the bag. Yeah, just stupid money. Yeah, but I kept coming back to it, kept coming back to it, kept coming back. And finally, I said, I haven't found another bag. And it was a terrific – and really, for me, it was an investment is the way I yes. look at it. It's not a traditional investment. I can't sell it for more money. But – I went through that process. So I think it's, it is, this gets to the kind of modeling and my kids saw me go through this process. <laughs> well, in that conversation, Evan, this conversation out loud with your kids, they're picking this stuff up. I mean, it's, yes. it's incredible. Uh, so 
I want to ask about kids and jobs then. So kids working versus kids getting, I mean, cause obviously working, earning a paycheck, part of yeah. learning about finance versus focusing on your schoolwork, getting school done, having the jobs later. Where do you stand on kids and jobs? This is a totally personal decision because, uh, David Owen, who wrote the first national book of dad, you know, he came on my podcast and he makes the case. He said their job <laughs> was to be focused on school, right? That was their gig. Now, it actually turns out that his son was kind of entrepreneurial and engaged in, uh, in uh, creating some kind of business opportunities. But that was his focus. And then there's the other side of the coin. So we're, we were kind of in both ways. We didn't really emphasize the need to have a job till they became teens. And it's different with each of the different kids. I mean, right now, my younger daughter, who's about to go to college, is making really good money scooping gelato. And that's terrific. And especially during the summer. You know, we defaulted to the focus being uh, much more on the schoolwork and the amount of work these kids have to do in school, especially if they're doing any other activities. It's just over the top. <laughs> so yeah. also holding it down a job, I think, is uh, fairly difficult to do. But during the summer, obviously, that's a great time for them to hold down a job. And the other thing I do want to just say is that for the people that have like bristle at allowance, uh, then you can just ramp it down. So like as as they start to, you know, if you're giving them allowance as a teen and now they're starting to make money, then you can just turn the dial down on allowance because now they're making their own money and they, they, they should have more control over that money. And then you can encourage them you know, for example, let's put some money away for taxes or let's put some money into your Roth IRA. Maybe we'll even match that money as an incentive because everything's about incentives and it's not going to be very exciting for them to put money into a Roth IRA, but it's obviously something that would behoove their future selves. And so if there's some way we can incentivize that, great. Well, and I love with older kids, you talked about the rule of 72 earlier. If you show them compounding, our mutual friend, Gene Natale, talks a lot about that, about yep. show them the Roth IRA and how they can become a millionaire. And all of a sudden your kid's like, I can become a millionaire? Really? <laughs> it's, <okay. laughs> it's exciting. You know, it gets at the, I think the toughest thing for all of us to get to understand, it's unfathomable. Even at my age, the power of compounding can only be experienced through time. And that's that's one of the most difficult things to get across. So even the best analogies that I've seen, I think don't do it justice to our brains because our brains are so now focused. You know, we're so not future focused. And you think about for a kid even more so, it's really a tough thing to try to, to get across the power of compound interest. You know, it's like we all know the it was Warren Buffett made 97% of his wealth after age 50, right? So it's it's really hard to get our heads around how powerful that is. So all we can do is help them build the habits that will help them take advantage of that, I think. You and I could talk forever, my friend, but I'm looking at the <laughs> clock. And uh, yeah. if only there were a resource like a podcast where you talked about this all the time. Man, I wish. Oh, wait a minute. There might be, <laughs> there might be one called The Art of Allowance with John Lanza. Tell us what's coming up on the show. I just interviewed Ann Garcia, who uh, has a new book out, How to Pay for College. So we'll be talking about that because the uh, that pain is real. We have two kids uh, in college now, and it's it's a confusing landscape. And Ann will bring some very good clarity to that. She is really a clear thinker when it comes to how parents should think about this. So uh, we've got that coming up, which I think will be really exciting. So. It's fun to talk to people at all different ages, uh, different areas of the spectrum, the young kids, and this will be for the older kids, for the parents of the older kids. Of course, you do want to start saving for your kids as early as possible, and, and we talk about that with Anne as well. That's fabulous. It's the Art of Allowance podcast, wherever finer podcasts are distributed, <laughs> which I think is, is pretty much everywhere, John. John, thanks a ton for hanging out with us and helping us raise uh, Money Smart Kids. I really appreciate it. Joe, I really appreciate being on Stacking Benjamins. This has been a lot of fun. Hi, I'm David Hirsch, and when I'm not hosting the Dad to Dad podcast for the Special Fathers Network, which is a Dad to Dad mentoring program for fathers raising kids with special needs, I'm stacking Benjamins. Oh, gee, I know we've talked about this a few times on the show about you and your kids and money, but for people that are new to the show, it's a great day for us to go over this again since we're specifically in the title of this episode talking about curriculum. Do you involve your kids in the money discussions around the OG household? It's like you were sitting in the living room of my house yesterday 
if part oh. of it's going, huh? I wonder what we should talk about on the we podcast. We definitely weren't, Joe. We were definitely not listening in, were we? You, oh, not, you, n- not you at all. You put some black tape over that red blinking light, didn't you? Just if you look to the left and wave, OG. You'll... <laughs> so there I was sitting on the couch. And my daughter says, Daddy, what are you doing? And I said, these are called scratch-offs. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. How do you do it? And I said, well, you scratch this off, and you if it matches, the cap. Then, then you want some money. <laughs> see, Caroline, right after you buy the smokes. <laughs> I know you guys think that I'm actually kidding, but, but I decidedly am not. I, I, you know how I like some people binge watch Netflix? I, I binged scratch offs yesterday i was like i was at the store and i was like i need to get back into this this is this is <laughs> I, this is what's been missing from my financial life give me a big old fat stack of the i used to i used to chew tobacco <laughs> and smoke cigar i don't do anything fun anymore but damn it i'm getting back into scratchers i've had scratchers. I've had way too much winning in my life lately my money situation's been way too good let's see if i can grind that to a halt oh god anyways we went a little overboard on scratchers yesterday, but we had a nice, nice chat about it, about how uh, you're always one, you're always one little, one little wagon wheel scratch away from a hundred thousand. You know, it's always the wagon wheel. You're just waiting on the one, and then you can fill out that bingo card to to do it. But uh, as my son said after he scratched off a couple, Dad, these things are rigged. I was like, y- Yes, you think? You think? <laughs> right. <laughs> We just lost like a thousand listeners right there. John Lanza's going to come back down with a baseball bat. <laughs> guys are not paying attention. Let's distract everybody and throw out the Haven Lifeline right now and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Right now, it's scratch offs. Are you kidding me? How, how could I have another answer besides that? As soon as we're done, I'm running out to the. Liquor store. See? Losing is contagious. If my financial advisor is saying this is what he's doing for his future, <laughs> you're damn well sure that's what I'm going to go do. It's your loved ones in your time and maybe the hilarity of a scratch off or two. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. By the time you get that all that last wagon wheel scratched off, you'll find the application's already done. You've already got an instant coverage decision. You know what the price is going to be, and you can get your life insurance done. StackingBenjamins.com slash Haven Life for a solution to your life insurance that's a guaranteed scratch-off winner every time. How about, do you think Matt from Haven there Life will like that one? I don't like know. it. Today, we're going to throw out the uh, Haven Life line to a uh, man, guy with a nickname. It's not Will with us. It's Big Will. Hey, Big Will. Hey Doug, Joe, and OG. I need to disguise my voice. I don't want anyone to know that I am the one other person that listens to this podcast and I would hate to be the first person to admit I have learned a few things on the podcast. The other issue is I am in witness protection, but that's another story. (laughs) So, here is my question. My wife and I are retired. I am a do-it-myselfer, handle all the home finances, taxes, etc., We paid a financial advisor to backtest our plan and we are basically set. My only concern is when I pass, my wife who has no interest in finance, taxes, etc. will have issues. I have started the process of her doing things with her. We have started together to balance checkbook, pay bills, having monthly money meetings, and watch me rebalance yearly, etc. The last two items I watch her eyes glaze over and that's even before her beers. (laughs) <laughs> so, my main concerns are the investments and taxes. Taxes seem simple, just find a tax professional. But the handling of investments seems to be the issue. Because our plan is strong and all our goals are being met, I am not sure of turning our investments over to an advisor is the way to go. Basically, all she would need to do is rebalance yearly and make withdrawals as needed. At first, I was thinking a robo-advisor, but that doesn't seem to make sense. Now I was now thinking maybe just put all our funds into a low-cost 50-50 balanced fund and have a five-year in cash and she makes withdrawals as needed. Am I being short-sighted? Thanks for any input. Oh, and Doug, I know you've been wanting a t-shirt. On August 3rd, I will be at the Sizzler, 
I will be wearing dark glasses and a copy of El Camino Monthly under my right arm. <laughs> Leave the cash inside the third stall in the men's room and I will drop the t-shirt off. Oh wink, God. wink. <laughs> See ya. Oh Wouldn't be the first deal I've done in that <laughs> stall in the bathroom. <laughs> 20 bucks is 20 bucks, right? That's Sorry. right. <laughs> the calls. <laughs> I don't... The calls just get... Just kidding. at first, I'm like, Doug, stop messing with us, and uh, that was not you. It never. I got to hand it to that guy because it never even occurred to me to do a robot voice, but <laughs> guarantee you that's coming. <laughs> Just at first, I'm like, oh crap, but wow, wow. Okay, serious question there, OG. Behind all the theatrics, we've got a spouse who is uh, bored silly by money management, and you know. Uh, I mean, I really like what John Lanza said earlier about maybe a weekly meeting versus a monthly, you know, about short, fun, uh, take care of that because monthly might not be often enough, but, but eyes glazing over is a difficulty. I think this is the crux of, you know, hire professional or don't hire professional. And sometimes we look at it in, in purely the dollars and cents standpoint. Right, the ubiquitous, you know, using a using an advisor as an example, uh, the the ubiquitous one percent number, right? And you go, well, I've got three million bucks. Holy crap, that's thirty thousand dollars. As opposed to considering it from a percentage standpoint and going, it's one percent. It's a pro, it's a it's a portion of the return of the portfolio. It's a portion of the dividends of the portfolio. You know, some of the time when you hire a professional, what you're trying to trying to do is to fix a problem. Right, you're trying to say I, I don't know how to solve this, or I've done a poor job at this, and but the only solution I have is to hire somebody who can do it for me. Whether it's taxes, estate planning, financial planning, lawn care, it doesn't matter. Sometimes you hire somebody to prevent mistakes that could happen along the way. For example, you might hire an attorney to do all of your estate planning because yeah, can you can you write your will on a notebook paper and stuff it in the cushions of your chair? Yes. Is it legally enforceable? Maybe Aretha Franklin's family is finding out that maybe it is or maybe it's not. It doesn't mean that's not what she did, and it doesn't mean it's not valid. It's just there's a lot of issues with doing it that way. So that's a mistake that you can avoid by just having a professional do it. And then sometimes you you hire a professional to do things that you don't know exist, right? You, you know, you have somebody look at your taxes, or you have a CPA that does your taxes, and they say, oh. Did you know that you could take this credit? Let's look back the last couple of years. Oh my goodness, you haven't been taking this credit. We're going to do this from now on. And therefore you, you know, saved a certain dollar amount in taxes or something like that. When it comes to stuff for a spouse who's not, or a partner who's not super excited about money, it's probably not about fixing problems. To this caller's point, they said that they went through the financial planning process, you know, kind of did a once over and everything looks great. So, so they're not trying to fix a problem that exists right? What we're trying to do is prevent a mistake or find some additional areas of opportunity. Yeah. It could be just as simple as like, well, if I'm dead, the wife takes money out of the account. Well, yeah, but is there a better way to do it than just randomly taking money out of the account? Can we be smarter with taxes in terms of pre-tax withdrawals or after-tax withdrawals or, you know, those sorts of things? Can we be smarter with distributions in terms of, you know, where do we leave assets if there's kids or grandkids or other places that you care about, charitable strategies and that sort of thing? So I think there's an opportunity to engage a professional at different levels and at different times in your life. And this is probably one of those ones where you could say, is the juice worth the squeeze? Maybe. Your, your wife might think so uh, in terms of, I don't have to think about this and it only costs me a small percentage overall of our, of our net worth every single year. Deal. How do I sign up? But maybe that's not a conversation that you have to have right now. I don't know. But this has got to be... I, I don't think the planner's for him. I think the planner is somebody that can help her be more excited about the process. So really, this is where he's got to kind of take a back seat. And this is a problem that I, you know, that I had when I was a planner in meetings sometimes was that the guy would want to geek out. I mean, it wasn't always the guy that wanted to geek out, but by and large, it was. Uh, the guy'd want to geek out and his spouse would sit there asleep well, I'm going deep on stuff that she does not care about and we're losing her. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. not even I'm not even helping her get any closer to her money. I'm actually helping push her away because the engineer in the family won't go back to a one-on-one -on -one level and relate this to actually any of our goal attainment. Like we're so in the weeds about little tiny things that that the nerds care about that um 
that we lose the other person. So I think it has to be somebody that the other spouse interfaces with much more than this person. Yeah. And make no mistake about it. If something happens to you, your spouse will seek counsel from someone, whether it's her girlfriend at church or a colleague at work or a a child or a, you know, a sibling, like there's going to be some counsel from someone and, you know, because she's been getting it her whole life from you. And so if you want that to have, if you want to have some influence on making sure that that decision process is good, I think you have to start it sooner while you have some influence on that. If you don't, then there is some chance that she makes a decision or goes down a path that you don't think would be the best solution. I I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I, I can think of this example very clearly. The widow says, I don't know what to do with all this. She's at the bank and the banker says, oh, well, why don't we just put it all in a nice safe CD? It'll be, you know, it's guaranteed every single year. You're going to get some nice interest. It never goes down. You never have to worry about it going up and down. Bada boom, bada bing. Okay, cool. Now you just take your whole nest egg out of, you know, the thing that's going to grow and compound with, you know, to offset inflation and all that other sort of stuff. And you just dumped it into a savings account. Like how much is that worth over the life of the rest of your retirement, your wife's retirement, your kids retire, you know? The, the the time value of that is worth many multiples of paying an advisor to go, no, don't do that. So she's going to find counsel because she's always had it. So why wouldn't she keep on having it? My issue with the uh, the balanced fund approach, and I agree that a, a robo in this situation probably doesn't do anything that he's trying to fix. Although I do like robos for people with money much more than for somebody who's 24 years old and just beginning I think you're wasting a lot of the cool stuff that a robo approach could do when you have a very small portfolio. But I think that, um, I guess it's a, you know, it's a big part of the topic that I'm going to talk about at Camp Fi, Texas, early next month. And I'm going to talk about Mbali OG, which is that, you know, when you're quote, okay, maybe your goals aren't big enough. Maybe there's another range of goals. And, and, and what I'm okay leads to is wasting money with an approach that's really sloppy. And you look at if you paid as much attention to your asset allocation as you paid to the other pieces of your financial plan, you know, your frugality, the uh, the way you spend money, your tax strategy, whatever that is, if you were like that with your asset allocation, you could probably find a lot of money there. Or for your spouse, find a strategy that she could be involved in, which really uh, helps bring her along. So I'm not at all a fan of, hey, let's just use a balanced 50-50 approach and just let it slide. Yeah. Like that is so sloppy. And it's um, it's underachieving. It's underachieving by a long way. Well, and, you know, juxtaposed against the, well, but I don't want to hire somebody to do it. <laughs> it's like you'll you'll underperform and under, like all of the stuff that you're trying to solve for, will be under uh, undervalued. I don't even know what the right word is. You know, you'll you'll under attain all of that stuff by just going, well, I'll just make it easy and go 50-50 as opposed to going, well, why don't I just structure this around working toward the goals that are important to me and have somebody who's on my side who can kind of help shepherd us along the way, provide advice, provide counsel, prevent mistakes, give us new ideas and be a resource for the people that we care about, uh, you know, on the back end if something happens. So Pennywise, Pound Foolish. We're going to touch on this uh, on our Friday show with Michael Kitzes a little bit. Ah, yeah, that's coming But up. I really think that, um, that this isn't, you know, there's a recent piece in Investment News OG about advisors who are getting out of just being advisors for everybody and going, nope, I'm really helpful in these situations and I'm not helpful in these other ones. Like advisors niching down almost as much for their quality of life. And I think it's got to be that type of approach. I don't think the answer is just go find an advisor and here you go. I think it's got to start with what do I really want? What am I trying to do? Which is education for the spouse, which is a better asset allocation, which is when I pass away, how how do we make sure that she's got a trusted person to go to? So you've kind of helped, uh, helped her along in that route. So somebody who's really on my board of directors already, you know, somebody's helping me make smarter decisions. I mean, you can already see that there's this laundry list of much more specific questions that you're going to ask this person. So I don't think it's just advisor or not an advisor. I think it's honing in on really what are you after and then who who would be my my ideal person I'm trying to add to my family board. 
Thanks for the question, uh, Big Will. <laughs> I thought he was gonna he was gonna say this is anonymous, and we are on to you, stacking <laughs> Benjamins or what? You know what's what's that group? Isn't it anonymous that yeah. shows up with the Guy Fox mask and and all that? But whew, thankfully not. It was much less creepy than that. <laughs> hey, co- hey, coming up. On our community calendar, I am going to have Andy Hill on our Instagram live. That is tomorrow night, Thursday evening, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Andy is, speaking of uh, kids and money, Andy's working hard to help his kids become millionaires at a young age. And that includes helping them learn to save early, helping them learn to earn money, Lots of of uh, key takeaways. So Andy and I talking about that tomorrow as a kind of a second handsomest man in personal finance. Two. Very very good looking behind uh, OG. <coughs> is that what you're saying? Oh <coughs> oh yeah that. Well, we're trying to get people to watch the YouTube version of the show, right? <laughs> and Andy Hill tomorrow, who is very 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 handsome, dreamy. Uh, some may say. I can't even think when I'm talking to that guy. <laughs> And Andy, tomorrow, coming up Friday, we're talking about uh, the future of advice, and we're talking about the science of advice versus practical advice, and uh, which advice you take, which ones you turn down with. One of the top people in the financial advising industry, OG, besides OG, uh, Michael Kitzes, joins us for a rollicking episode. That's our community calendar coming up. If you're somebody that right now you want to make better decisions with your money, OG and his team are taking clients away to stackybedjamins.com slash OG. If you're somebody looking for a person to add to the team, I need to begin those interviewing processes, stackybenjamins.com slash OG. All right. That's it for today. Man, great show, gents. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take some advice from John Lanza and let's all help get kids on track for a lifetime of financial security by teaching them to have financial literacy. And teach them this. If you have a plan, you won't have to panic. Second, do you pay for stuff? Remember, some methods have protection and others don't. Practice safe payments, kids. But the big lesson? I gotta start doing silly voices on this show. Maybe that's gonna land me that sweet 20 grand a week gig. Check this out, Joe. Lads all, folks. Thanks to John Lanza for joining us today. You can find his podcast, The Art of Allowance, wherever you're listening right now. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of The Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.
Guys, I haven't done a movie review in a few weeks, and I thought uh, this is a this is a good one to talk about. This is a little known man in it named uh, Tom Cruise. You pronounce it Cruise? Our lives are the sum of our choices. cannot escape the past. Ethan, this mission of yours is gonna cost you dearly. The world is changing. Truth is vanishing. War is coming. been a long time, friend. You've no idea the power I represent. It knows your story and how it ends. And like any Mission Impossible movie, there is uh, car chase after car chase. Uh, lots of stuff blowing up, OG. Tons of stuff blowing up. You know, the first like uh, two or three Mission Impossibles I avoided because I was like, this just seems stupid. I don't know that I want anything to do with this. And then maybe it was the fourth one I started watching, but it was it was the one where they climbed the world's biggest building. The what's it called? The Burj Khalifa? The uh, Burj Khalifa. Burj yeah, Khalifa. Yeah. yeah, Burj Khalifa. And they actually go on the outside and Tom Cruise does all his own stunts. That was a very, very good movie. I absolutely love that movie. And then I've been addicted since that. Uh, so I was super excited when a new Mission Impossible came out. And uh, this one, what I hate is when I see part one, part one of two, because that's a commitment. And I, you know, what's that Jim Gaffigan joke? I don't have time to go to meetings. <laughs> like I just, just give me, give me the movie and let me uh, just watch it in one sitting and I'll be, I'll be good. Which is funny because, you know, Jack Ryan, we talked about, before and I'll sit through plenty of episodes on Netflix, but sh having to show up at a theater twice for a part one, part two just kind of drives me crazy. Maybe it's because you know Lord of the Rings made us do that, and we waited forever for those things. And and uh, I don't know something about that that I don't like. That said, this movie has a fine ending. You know that it's going to continue, but it does have a resolution of part one sends it into part two, which frankly is going to be a self-contained story. I think you'd be able to watch part two without part one. You can watch part one and go, okay, I've had enough. I don't want to watch part two. The thing I liked about this best guys, you know, Mission Impossible over the years has been based on what do we fear? What is kind of going on in the zeitgeist? And right now it's this AI thing. And so what we have is we have the quote bad guy. It's not a bad guy at all. It's a bad machine. And it's now Ethan, Tom Cruise, against a machine. And uh, the machine's trying to take down take down a lot of stuff. Sounds like Space Odyssey 2001 with better action. Skynet. It is so Skynet. But it's funny. I mean, these, you know, you can't have Simon Pegg in a movie and not have it be funny. Like the, like the hench people, you get this feeling like I did on Jack Ryan of the team, you know, going at them. You have this new, you have a new character who she's kind of on the team, kind of not on the team. And, um, you know, she kind of throws in some, throws in some stuff. I, I, I highly recommend this movie. I know it's been overshadowed by Barbie and, uh, Oppenheimer. I'm going to go see Oppenheimer this weekend. I was going to see it last weekend, but I couldn't sit in a theater for three hours. I'm like, I just. Prostate problems. <laughs> no, I just didn't want to do it. And plus there's, there's more previews than ever before. So it's like three hours and 40 minutes. So, uh, yeah. I always saw it. Oppenheimer. They loved it. I think it'd be great. Nick saw it. My son saw it, said it was awesome. I can't wait to see it. But I, yeah. So uh, Mission Impossible, though, kind of overshadowed by those, but a big thumb up. I think you guys would both love it. I already saw it. I've never seen a single one. The day it came out. <laughs> Did you see it the day it came out, OG? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Took the boys. Do you agree with that assessment? Did you really like it? I thought it was great. Yeah. I mean, I don't care about the part one, whatever. We did uh, probably... Uh, I feel like it's been a couple of Mission Impossibles ago where we committed to them you know it's like yeah. this is coming out in the, you know i you know i want the boys to come see him with me so we started over and, and like watched him in sequence over the course of like 
oh, half a month or something, kind of got through all of the Mission Impossible. Oh, cool. So then we could roll into whichever one it was that we ended up seeing at the theater the first time. So you get all the subplots and, bla- and backstory, which are so important to Mission Impossibles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, all the... All the, all the Easter eggs. Have they kind of just generally gotten better? I feel like they've gotten Absolutely. better. They've gotten tighter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this one, this one was a very long movie also, I thought. Yeah. And you could see why they said, well, we just got to name this one because like every time you go, okay, we, we're coming to an end. This is going to be, and it's like, oh no, there's a whole new part here. And then it's like, okay, all right, now we're coming to an end. And no, it just keeps out. There's like always a little. It's like Cedar Point. You know, you go up, you go down, and you're like, yeah. that's it. And then you go back up again. Nope. Yeah. And you keep going. So, But I was on my the edge of my seat for the whole thing. It did not feel long. It wasn't a movie that felt I'd seen long. a number of previews, a number of like behind the scenes stuff. Like uh, the most famous one, of course, was the, the motorcycle jumping off the cliff and like how they filmed that and that sort of thing and the story behind how they did all that. So, you know, so you're watching they're going, when's he going to get on the motorcycle and how's this going to kind of right. work? Me too. Yeah. And then he, and then he does it, of course. But, um, but yeah, I like all the Mission Impossible movies. They're not, they're popcorn movies. They're not, they're not super stressful. You know, the good guys are eventually going to win. Probably. There's a lot of twists and turns, a lot of whodunits. Those are that, you know, that's kind of interesting to me. I've, I enjoy well, I've that, said so. that I don't like action scenes when there's really no consequences, which is my problem with a lot of the Marvel movies where I'm like, I'm going to watch a 20 minute fight scene. I really don't care. I, I hope yeah, Ant-Man gets no choked one will out. Die. Yeah. <laughs> if Ant-Man yeah. dies here, that, that'd be super cool for me like that'd be great well i mean think about the marvel movie where iron man did die right when they like wrote him out i think it was iron man right does anybody know i think it was iron man right that was like a big shock that was like holy cow one of them sure like what what you know and then they went oh well we'll get him back by just going into a parallel universe and then yeah which you're like okay one other thing but uh yes mission impossible super awesome Mix a little sports analysis, pop culture, and great interviews, and you've got the Rich Eisen Show podcast. The Jets are bracing themselves into doing hard knocks this year. <laughs> bracing themselves. Look, coaches want to control the controllables. They don't want to have a camera crew in the building. You know, I know that they want to lie low. This is what happens when you go and swing for the fences and get Aaron Rodgers. Are you kidding me? The Rich Eisen Show podcast, wherever you listen.